that as a result of fighting in the front line of the war on drugs. Because these gangsters are even more violent, these are more vicious than anyone you've dealt with so far. And my head was starting to hurt, you know, and I was thinking, I'm not going to get out of here. you have a fascinating story and and for our friends at home neil is probably the country's most or one of the most successful undercover policemen um i'm privileged to know two former undercover detectives both of whom have over um or at least one of whom has overcome some huge issues with with trauma i also had peter blexley on the show um, speaks very, very highly of Neil uh, for being one of the country's leading detectives. So thank you on, on behalf of the podcast, Neil. Shall we go back to when, when you joined the police, which I've just been reading about? Yeah, if you like. Um, I, I joined the police in 1989. Um, and uh, the, the reason I did that I didn't have a sort of boyhood ambition to, to join the police. I wasn't one of these people who, who, who always wanted to do it. Um, but I went to university by mistake. Uh, why I ever thought I would enjoy a business studies, business studies course, I have no idea. Uh, so I dropped out of that and then was wondering what to do next. I was considering backpacking around Europe, actually, because a couple of friends had done that, fruit picking and that kind of thing. That sounded adventurous. But then I saw an advertisement for the for the police in the newspaper. So unable to make my mind up I flipped a coin so I was literally flippant about my career choice but um but once I got into the police you know I did get this this sense of um a sense of duty you know that I really should try and do a good job of, unfortunately I was crap at it I, I I really I was no good at it at all the first couple of years I almost lost my job several times I was a I didn't realize how much of a naive 19 year old I was when I when I started in the police um but I survived the first two years, just, and um, then I, I moved to the north of the county because I, I was I was working in Derbyshire, went went back to the north of the county, working at Glossop. But then I sort of I I improved enough to eventually get a, an attachment to the drug squad in 1993, and that's when my career took off, I suppose, because one of them. Um, asked me if I wanted to have a go at buying some crack cocaine, which I thought was a really strange suggestion. Um, but I was given £20 and directed to this blue terrace door in Normanton in Derby. Uh, knocked on the door and um, said, can I, have a, can I have a ting, please? And after a, a conversation, he, he, he sold me this £20 rock of crack. And I came back to the drug squad like, there you go, I've got it. And that then defined the next uh, 14 years of my life because that kind of low level undercover work was entirely new in the UK. It had been going on in America for a good 20 years, but you know, the undercover work in the UK was kept to the more sophisticated high end um, undercover work that Peter Blacksley used to do. But this, this working, working your way up from the street level up uh, was 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 new it was a new tactic and it's interesting because th that first chap I bought off you know when I was walking away said you take care now don't get yourself arrested mm. which I thought was really nice of him you know that's really nice advice um, but it, but it's important to note that because on that first occasion it wasn't really that difficult because he didn't know that there were cops out there trying to catch him out this way. And not many people did. So to start with, it was it was not too difficult. But of course, he went to prison and people talked to each other. And suddenly, all of the organised crime gangs, which run the supply of heroin and cracking in our inner cities, 
they suddenly knew that there was a new tactic out to get them. And so it became increasingly difficult. I would, at the very beginning, I was doing operations for a few weeks, but that quickly became much longer. And I ended up traveling all around the UK, well, all around England, um, working for no less than six or seven months at a time, because that's, you know, it became more difficult to actually gather the evidence. Um, yeah, so that, that's how I started uh, as, as, a, as a young cop. But it, it's probably worth noting that the reason that there was suddenly a drive for new tactics in 1993 and the reason that took me to that door buying that crack cocaine is that for a few years there had been a growing moral panic in the UK. And that moral panic was about crack cocaine. And we'd had this moral panic for years, literally years before we actually had any crack cocaine on the streets because the tabloid newspapers were publishing stories every week about how crack cocaine was destroying America and destroying communities with a heavy emphasis on black communities. And it wasn't so many years before that Nancy Reagan had, um, you know, was, was right across everyone's TV screen saying one smoke of crack cocaine and you're addicted for life. It's just, it'll destroy you in one instant. Should Which, we, is it the right time to point out that it's all her husband's cronies were in, importing it into the country in the first place? Come. Well, allegedly the CIA, you know, it, it is suggested that the CIA had something to do with, with some of that to fund various um, foreign uh, military uh, endeavours. But I think that that sort of detracts from, from, from some of the truths about, about crack cocaine. The first truth is that it's, she was talking nonsense, was Nancy. Um, it, it, it's no more likely to suddenly get you hooked than than the brandies that she that, that got Nancy Reagan hooked. You know, she, I mean, she was notoriously an alcoholic, um, but she was no more likely to be an alcoholic than anyone is likely to have been a, a, someone to develop a problem with crack. There are, you know, they're around the same kind of percentage of people who do develop a problem with those, with those drugs. So, you know, to create a moral panic about one drug and not the other is, 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 is literally a deception. It's, it's just the persecution of a minority. Um, and it's some of the social deprivation in America and, and where problematic drug use took hold, you know, there, there are social and health drivers behind this. And the, the political rhetoric to, to blame minorities for these problems is, is a way of avoiding the political reality that you, you should be doing something about those social drivers. Um, so, you know, we can talk about the CIA and the wars, but that's a, that's a distraction really from, 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 the, real, from the real issues, if, if you'll forgive me for, for, for putting it in those terms. No, that's fine. So, um, yeah, so, so quite quickly, I was, um, I was working for, for, for no less than six or seven months at a time. Now, I should point out at this time, there was, there was no training for this. There was no training at all. So I was literally just trying to learn on, on, on the way. Um, and a few years later, I helped develop the training for other undercover cops. But in, that, in those first few years, it, it really was just trying to work out what happened. Now, to, to start with, I presented myself as a bit of a, a traveling scally. Now, you don't sound like you've got the accent that wouldn't understand what that word means, scally. So it's a sort of northern term, um, like a, tra a traveling thief, someone who, who, who would have a go at any bit of thieving. Mate, do you know, do you know who runs the drugs trade where I live? <laughs> that it's all run by Liverpudlian gangs. Well, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's around that. That's true. For as, as far north as Aberdeen and as far south as uh, as Brighton in, in the UK, you've got mm. you've got Liverpool gangs doing that. Um, so you, so you understand Scally then. Um, so so I, I would dress up as a Scally. I would there with would be there with my Nike Air Max trainers, uh, my full tracksuit. You know, no disrespect to anyone uh, listening who's really into their sportswear. It's just that in the 1990s, that really was the uniform of thieves. So, so that you know, that would open me a few doors. Um, 
you know, I could talk the, that kind of talk. But I quickly realized that actually the people with the most connections, the people who knew all of the dealers um, who could help me out the most were the people who were really on the fringes of society, people who were living in squats or are homeless or were sort of on the fringes of that kind of community. People who had the most problematic drug use, the people with, with the most trauma. So I, I realized that if I dressed a little bit like them, I could fit into that community it opened up much more doors for me so that's what I started to do and, and I, I, I got extra scruffy and started hanging around in squats and getting to know people like that and I learned that in order to to facilitate what I needed then it was best to manipulate the most vulnerable people among in those groups Anyway, it's, it's a harsh reality that in undercover policing, the vulnerable people are the easiest to manipulate. And, and that's what I'm about. I'm about manipulating entire communities and, you know, the individuals that can help me do that. So I picked on the vulnerable people. And that, that brought me much more success because they knew all of the people. I could manipulate them into, into introducing me um, you know, up the tree, climb, you know, climb the ladder and get close to the, the people who are who were the regional suppliers and, and start dealing with them directly. And sometimes by increasing the quantities I was buying or, you know, making myself out to be a, a bit of a, a dealer, I would, you know, I would I'd be traveling and selling this elsewhere. So that was, that was the tactics I used, but there was, um, it, for, for my support crew, because the way, the way that it, the tactic or rather the, um, the procedure developed around me because I, I would be traveling around the country on loan to different police forces and procedurally what happened eventually is that because of the growing evidence of corruption that existed as a result of the illicit drugs trade a system developed uh, and by, by sorry, by this stage, there was a specialist regional department which became responsible for running my kind of work. It was called the East Midlands Special Operations Unit. And the strategy they developed is that where, wherever I would go to a, a host force, I would have to have a set team, a certain team around me. So I'd have to have someone looking after my technical equipment, exhibits, uh, someone specifically designated for intelligence, uh, backup team. So the very key roles around me. But before I got there, they would all be given a, a lawful order that they were not to ask me my real name and not to ask me where I was from. So I was using the same pseudonym for the gangsters as I was to the cops I was working with. And that was to protect me from corruption. So I was cocooned and sort of separated, really, even from the cops that I was that I was working with. Obviously, that policy that became you know, that, that written policy is in itself an admission that corruption is endemic because otherwise those safeguards wouldn't be needed. They wouldn't be needed. But it meant that um, I, I became a figure of, of, of some amusement, you know, and fascination to those to those cops because it, it, it creates a, a bigger air of sort of um, mystery, doesn't it? Oh, this, this undercover cop's going to come and work for us and we're not even allowed to ask him his real name. Or where he's from, you know, it, it creates that sort of um, mystery and separation between me and them. But you know, we we tend to break it down with humour. And I remember one day working in Nottinghamshire, I was being I was being dropped off in Nottingham, and I developed a technique that week. Whereas if I took my clothes off at the end of the day and put them in tightly in a plastic bag and put them in a warm place overnight, they'd smell really bad the next day. And for me, this was quite useful for cover, you know, to, to fit in with people. But anyway, they were driving me to, to a place I needed to be dropped off. And they were winding the window down and sticking their heads out the window saying, oh, you smelly bastard, you're going to make this car stink all day. So this was making me laugh. But anyway, they, they dropped me off and I looked a real mess. And that day I was, I was um, going meeting a heroin dealer who I'd been buying weights off for a while he was someone I trusted but he was being driven around in a taxi this day but he still made me walk over a mile to meet him in a certain place 
And it was just on the edge of what was then, it might still be now, but then it was the, the edge of the red light area in Nottingham, which was near, it's quite a sort of, sort of posh area really, um, but near to where they have the Goose Fair. And there's this long curving road and I was walking along and I heard this voice say, sex for sale. I thought, I know this is Nottingham, but it's half past one in the afternoon. That seems quite forward, you know, to be shouting wares like that at half past one in the afternoon. So I carried on walking and I heard again, sex for sale. I couldn't see anyone because it's a long curving road. And again, I heard sex for sale. But then I saw her as the curve as, as the curve in the road straightened a bit. And I was walking towards her. And as I walked towards her, she looked me up and down and said, cheap, sex for sale. I thought, well, I suppose that's a testament to how scruffy I look. So I suppose I've done a good job there. Um, and I walked past her and I went to, to carry on and meet the dealer. And then later on, you know, after I'd bought some heroin, dropped, did an evidence drop, bought some crack, went back and the, de the debrief from the team at the end of the day, so I could tell the intelligence guy everything, so he could go and research and cross-reference things. The team sat around listening to me and I told them about this. I told them about this woman offering me cheap sex. And they all laughed. And... I've done training to police all over the place when I've told them about this and, and the audience always laughs. Uh, wherever I go, generally people laugh. But, you know, I look back on that day and I have no idea what the dealer looks like. I can't remember. No idea. It's just one face in an endless, endless sea of dealer's faces. But I can close my eyes and I can see her perfectly. I can, I can see her very clearly. I know exactly what she looks like because she was tall and slim and she, she wasn't a day over 21, I would say. And she was clutching a kind of special brew, um, super strength lager. And the reason that she was clutching that kind of special brew was because she was struggling with the withdrawal from heroin. And it's that withdrawal from heroin that had taken her to the streets of Nottingham to offer me cheap sex. Mm. Now, I was the agent of the state that day. Consider the resources that had gone into just my support team and, and, and the, you know, my wages and all of the technical equipment. And, you know, drugs policing is the most expensive policing. There's more money goes into that than anything else. Consider the resources that had got into me. What, theoretically, to prevent problematic drug use or to prevent drug use. Whereas the person that actually needed help, as the agent of the state, I just walked right past her. Mm -hmm. She doesn't get any help. We just keep fighting this war. And I just keep going after the endless sea of dealers. And so that, you know, that's what sticks with me. And that's, that was one of the first instances where I realised, or, or began to realise, because actually I was resistant to the obvious conclusions, if I'm honest. But that was when my doubts started creeping in that there's something not right here because I'm seeing all this pain and we're fighting this war so aggressively and the, the, we're not doing anything to help people's pain. Why do you think, Neil, that you have that all-important quality of empathy when a, I think it's fair to say a good percentage of coppers are... Yeah... This is such a big subject to try to cover in, in a sentence or two, but I've seen the way coppers talk about young people. So you take a young person, they come from an underprivileged back, you know, background, traditionally ostracized, um, discriminated against, living on maybe a sink estate. The dad's doing this, the mum's doing that, if indeed the dad's around probably not right and in the in the police that i'm talking about size that kid is the problem right and it's and i think we're all a little bit like that when we're young servicemen um i don't know at what point 
you, the balance tips. Um, and yours clearly, when when you're relating to this woman, you you, you had empathy there. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few things to unpick there. From, I mean, I think times are changing. That's the most important thing to say. And and now, a, a large number of police do understand are are becoming trauma aware, and they do understand that this war on drugs is a disaster. You know, there are increasing numbers of of cops that realise that. And a, a lot of that is because of the work of Leap, Leap and Leap UK, the, the organisation I'm part of. You know, we, we, we speak to police, we're, we're, we have a presence online and we're, we're helping the social movement grow within police. But the most important thing to note is that the stigma, not just within policing, but within wider society, comes from the fact that, this, that behaviours have been criminalised and that minorities have been criminalised as a result of our drug policy. You know, the, the most dangerous drug uh, to society and individuals is alcohol. You know, there's a, there's, this has been proven. There's a, there's a very famous uh, paper published in The Lancet in 2010 by David Nutt and others uh, that, that, that shows that alcohol is substantially the most dangerous drug and that some drugs which society considers to be dangerous are, are actually not so much at all. Um, so this is a, this is about prejudice, misinformation, and most importantly, it's about the criminalization of people, because you know drugs are an in, inanimate object. We, we say that drugs are illegal, but it's actually the behaviour of some people has been made illegal by policy, which has no foundation in evidence at all, at all. But the trouble is, once somebody is made a criminal, then in the eyes of the public, and particularly the police who have to have, carry out laws, you know that that create that creates a stigma, and you know, there's a hard core of police who are very resistant to the kind of things that we say at Lee and that I say, because actually they see drug laws as a really useful way of catching bad people. And they don't distinguish between somebody who burgles a house and somebody who has a gram of cocaine in their pocket. They're just bad people you catch. And actually, Section 23 of the Misuse of Drugs Act, the ridiculously huge this you know one of the powers in the war chest of the misuse of drugs act that they just see that as a useful way of catching people and of course that plays out on the streets um in, in the way that it exposes unconscious bias and endemic and, and you know systematic racism in society because you know if you're a black person you're 10 times at least 10 times more likely to be stopped searched for drugs than you are if you're white and that's because this othering of people uh, that's, that, that, that drug, our drug policy contributes to means that prejudices are exposed and amplified. Because, you know, drug policy, it's about other people. It's, a, it's about the behaviour of those other people, uh, much the same as um, the laws, laws against homosexuality. That there isn't really any difference. It's about the behaviour of individuals. It's about individual liberty. I mean, as a young cop, I didn't, have, I didn't care about liberty. I cared about security. You know, I had the, uh, the classic police view that individual liberty should be sacrificed for the greater security. You know, I, was, I, di I didn't really understand the nuanced politics then, um, but I, I, I didn't care about, you know, I, about someone's liberty. I, I, I would quite happily go and get a search warrant and smash someone's door in and search the house without really much care about what that what that meant to that that person's individual freedom and liberty now i'm very sensitive to it now because i've learned but when it comes down to our drug laws this this is this is a serious a serious breach of liberty which is affecting the whole fabric of society if someone is gay that then that's that's then that's them that that's that's who they are and it's their mind, it's their body, it's their sexuality. It's not for the state to interfere with that. If someone can't stand alcohol, but likes to use cannabis to unwind after a long working week, then that's them. They're different to me, but it's their mind and their body. And it's important that that, that should be respected by the state. In fact, it's the responsibility of the state to make sure that their behavior is made as safe as possible mm -hmm. through regulation. I understand that now and it's obvious once it clicks you know once 
once you understand the damage that's been caused by infringing on individual liberty, then, you know, this, this attempt to restrict the behavior of some people is what gave birth to organized crime. We didn't have organized crime until we had drug laws, did it? It was birthed by our attempts to control some people's behavior. Mm. And it is the continuation of drug prohibition which keeps organized crime powerful. And a pa this powerful organized crime is corrupting our entire society. It's corrupting our criminal justice system. It's, cor it's, it's corrupting entire nation states. Look at Mexico, Guinea-Bissau in West Africa, narco states. Pe people use different drugs for different reasons. And, and the, obviously what you just referred to there is, <clears throat> is interesting because the dance music scene did go hand in hand with, with some of those drugs, in particular MDMA, of course. Um, and, and that's what drove its, it, it, its popularity because it goes so well with that scene. It goes so well with, with, with dance music and so, so do some of the hallucinogens like, like, like LSD. But I mean, although I did work in some nightclubs and I, I was exposed to that scene to a degree and I did, I did work that scene, uh, I loved I loved the music by the way I loved the whole scene I really did it was it was fantastic I'm a, I'm a big dance electronic music fan but almost all of my work was an entirely different world entirely different the work the world that I inhabited mostly was the heroin and crack cocaine scene which was completely separate from any any of the other drug markets at all completely different and it was primarily focused around the problematic heroin and crack cocaine scene, which is a very minority place indeed, actually, because, you know, it's it, it's around 10% of people who use crack cocaine will have a problem with it, which is the same for most drugs, actually. It's, it's about 10% of people use alcohol. It's slightly less for cannabis, slightly more for cocaine, around the same for amphetamine, but it's around the 10% mark. The outlier of that is heroin, because for heroin, it's 25% of people who use it will develop a problem with it, 25%. But so, sometimes people get surprised with that, um, that figure because, you know, we're, we're taught that heroin is only problematic, that everyone who uses it is problematic, and that's what the public have been led to believe. It's not true. 75% of people who use heroin have no problematic relationship with the drug whatsoever. You know, that's quite a shock to some people. But... That 25% is very high, which means that there, there is a huge market. There's an enormous amount of money to be made uh, to, in supplying the people who do have a problem. And that's the kind of world that I lived in. So it's a much darker world than the, the, the adult party drugs like MDMA and, and LSD. Um, hmm. Not, not, not least of which because, <clears throat> in fact, almost, almost primarily because the court sentences for dealing heroin and crack are much higher um, than other drugs. And so there's the great, much greater risk for those involved. And, and, and this, is, this is a very important point for anybody out there who thinks that the solution to drugs is just bigger sentences and tougher laws. Because, you know, that's, that's the opposing view quite often, that oh, you just need to lock them up all in for, for life, or you need to put them all on an island and kill them all, or you need to, you know, all these kind of aggressive responses that arch prohibitionists will come out with. They say, we're just not, not tough enough. We can get in tougher would solve it. Well, no, it doesn't, actually. You get tougher, all it means is the, the market becomes more violent. The most violent drug marketplaces in the world are the places that have the death penalty for dealing. Mm. Sri Lanka, Thailand, Singapore, where, where, wherever it is, or, or China. It just means that the marketplace is more violent in response because the bigger the risk, the more you have to threaten people to not grass you up. The more people you have to murder to make sure they don't tell the police. You, you ramp up um, the violence. If you ramp up the threat, the deterrent, in, this, in these marketplaces, the net response is just more violence. You never, ever reduce the size of the market. And it's the, 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 most, the, the, the most 
the awful illusion that's it, it's ever been made in public policy that the deterrence actually makes any impact on the drug markets. So, so yeah, there's a there's a world of difference between the the dance music scene that that beautiful cultural explosion actually that was the dance music scene, especially in the UK. That wonderful artistic expression, that coming together of people, that that breaking down of social barriers that you describe. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing, and it really did have great social benefit in breaking down in breaking down barriers. And I, I wonder if. I mean, dan you know, dance music scene's not gone away, but you just wonder with with the sort of xenophobia and um, the sort of isolationism and populist nature of the way that politics is is, is going around in, around some places in Europe and the UK. You just wonder sometimes if we if we're not just missing that sort of cultural spark a little bit at the moment. I don't, I don't know, but but that 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 wonderful scene as you say, is a, is a world apart from the kind of uh, grimy scene that I was involved in. And the, the, the place that I was moving as, a, as an undercover cop, that was, that's a result of not caring for people who need help. You know, it was because it was gangsters preying on the vulnerable people and that became the theatre of war and people like me were coming in and manipulating and taking advantage of the vulnerable people in order to continue fighting that war that's the reality of it you must have seen some pretty atrocious stuff mate because one of our one of the dealers in my city used to go out dancing with us you know well every, everyone would go to, to to this club and uh, he used to sell a few bits and pieces but i think he was also you know there was always that that bridge wasn't there. A bridge isn't. There was always that connection between the party, fun drugs, take a pill on a Saturday night, dance your ass off, and then, you know, go and look after the kids on a Sunday. You know, no problem there. But then there was also the uh, the link between the more problematic use. Um, so I don't know on a scale of a hundred percent. It's probably 10% in that dance club having a great time. But when they go home, they they still they're in the world of addiction still. You know, their life centers around it. They might be managing their, be you know, um, benefits around it, selling this to, to get by, getting the needles from the exchange, all this kind of this stuff. And this guy was one of those, Neil. He was he was sort of in the two worlds and he he got his head chopped off. I think his his missus was stabbed to death on the toilet um, by rival. You know, rival dealers or some, somebody that he'd upset. And that's when it does all get a bit serious, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that, that's true. Um... But again, I'm not people... sorry, I wasn't trying to be devil's advocate there. I'm just giving an example of one of the incidents that we we experienced here. And I'm wondering if you had sort of similar stuff yourself. Yeah, I mean, you, you make a good point there. But again, I have to try and unpick how, how people view things like that, because people associate the violence with the drug trade. And in fact, I did an interview with someone yesterday um, and they said, oh, so what, so what you're saying to me is as long as drugs are around, these things are going to happen. And I said, no, no, that's not the case. For as long as drugs are illegal, this is going to happen. And, you know, the violence comes from something quite often from something called a freelancer effect. I'll try and, mm -hmm. I'll try and explain it with, a, with a, uh, an anecdote. Um, I, one, of, one of my biggest operations was in Northampton and... I'd actually given up undercover work at this point because one of the vulnerable people I had manipulated and actually when he was in police custody because he got he was committing offences on bail he got roped into it all he ended up being suicidal when he was in police custody and the reason for that was that he saw me as his one friend in the world the only person he could trust the only person and so him, my betrayal of him was the final straw for his life of he was already trying to deal with childhood trauma this is the last straw for him. 
so this was emotionally this was a this was destroyed me really it was awful and I gave up the work but I was tempted back into the work because the DS uh, who ran these operations he knew how to manip manipulate me and he said to me look Woodsy we need you to do this job because these gangsters are even more violent these are more vicious than anyone you've dealt with so far these these this gang's using gang rape as part of their reputation building that their intimidation you know they're doing the normal kind of gangster stuff kidnappings maimings all that kind of thing but they, they're also raping people so we really need you to do this and he said look we've had two people try and get close to these already and they, they've not managed to and and by this stage i've sort of become a little bit of a troubleshooter um to try and to try and step in where there was this kind of lock jam so he manipulated me really emotionally manipulated me into saying well look, we, we need you to do this because they, we need to catch these violent criminals so i set off again into this this long-term operation in northampton and what they'd done this gang was from birmingham but they'd taken over the the, the whole supply in northampton uh, which is much the way that goes on now with, with what people talk about with county lines um in the you know it's big gangs from a city take over the supply in the smaller cities or smaller towns and they and they dominated it there so it took me several uh, weeks to get an introduction to these people i manipulated people into introducing me and i remember the first time i was taken to meet these guys i was taken into this snooker club and directed into the gents toilets went in there and the door burst open this hooded figure came in he went into the cubicle, stood in the toilet and looked over the top of the cubicle and said, what's this? And the guy that was introducing me started talking. And, but then as he starts asking me questions from the cubicle, the door burst open again and these four hooded figures came in and they started walking around me slowly. And every so often, one of them would headbutt me on the side of, on the ear or, or one of them would nudge me slightly and the other one would punch me in the ribs. And all the time I'm being interrogated and the guy who was introducing me is being asked questions. And then he's rephrasing the question to try and catch me out. And, you know, I knew the reputation of these people, you know, that one, one of them uh, was implicated in seven different murders in Birmingham. He's the guy who was, uh, who sourced the machine guns for the murder of Letitia Shakespeare and Charmaine Harris. So I, so I knew, I, I knew the caliber of these people and my head was starting to hurt. You know, and I was thinking, I'm not going to get out of here in one piece at all. This is it. You know, they're suspicious of me. I'm going to be left beaten and bloody in the in these toilets. You know, and, that, and that's what because that's what these people do. And just as I was resigning myself to that, then suddenly he, he said, "All right, then, what do you want?" And I went, "I'll have one and one, please." And I gave him my forty quid, and he gave me um, four point four of crack and a point four of heroin. And I was in then, I got his phone number and I was actually into the inner circle so that I had I got permission to buy directly from that gang rather than going to their runners and the, the, the separate people. I'd managed to work my way into them. And then for the next few months, I, I, I gathered evidence of conspiracy, um, working out who, who all of their runners were. So I, 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 I found out all about the network the sex workers that were dealing for them, the runners, the people doing the stashes, stashing the money, um, but the whole the whole network. And there was there was one point because at one point in operation you need to start getting corroborative evidence. So I'd started wearing a camera, a very tiny camera, uh, with a bit of technical equipment called an eagle. But I thought one day that that day that maybe the day before they got a little bit suspicious of me. And so I decided this morning not to wear the camera because I was a little bit nervous, which turned out to be an incredibly good decision because that day they snatched me and shoved me into the back of this van. I think it was a people carrier. I was struggling to remember this detail, but put me in the back of this van and got me to take me to the, the edge of this park in, the, in Northampton. Got me out and said, right, strip. You're 5-0. We know you are. And just so that they had showed no doubt that they want, wanted me to do as I was told. Um, one of them lifted a top up and there was a, uh, a gun shoved in the top of his trousers. So he made it quite clear that I had to do as I was told. So 
I stripped naked, thinking, thank goodness I wasn't actually wearing the camera today because I had no doubt at all that these people were capable of the most foolish and extreme violence. So I had no doubt that my life was at risk. Um, but, you know, I remember thinking, they, they said, come on, I mean, you're heat, you're five zero. I remember looking at this guy thinking, you're not old enough to have seen Hawaii Five-0. <laughs> but, but, it, but it's amazing how, you know, culturally this, this slang still exists. But anyway, but I, I, I survived that day and a few other scares with them. But, you know, after seven months in Northampton, I knew that I had met every single person connected with that trade, everyone. I'd got everyone's phone number. I'd got evidence against everybody involved. There was no one else to meet. I caught everyone. So we could call it. We did the call the strike. There were police from five different counties, the surrounding counties in the East Midlands area came in to help. Enormous amounts of resources, huge amounts of cops, 96 people. 96 people were arrested in that operation, including the six Burger Bar boys who were running the whole thing. Anyway, the, the intel cell um, cop contacted me after the dust had settled. He, he, the person had been keeping his ear to the ground following the impact of it. And um, he said to me, yep, we managed to interrupt the heroin and crack cocaine supply in Northampton for a full two hours. 96 people arrested, seven months of work, almost getting myself killed. Moments of genuine terror to interrupt the supply for about two hours. Now, if you're a problematic heroin user, that's not even enough time to withdraw before suddenly there's a phone number and someone else jumping into that marketplace and su supplying your, your, the commodity that, that you want. Now, I can't say with certainty that it was the, the infamous uh, rivals of the Burger Bar Boys, the Johnson crew, uh, the Johnson crew and the Burger Bar boys, it's been their sport for a few years to kill each other. They've got their, you know, classic rivals. I can't say it's the Johnson crew that took up that opportunity that was created, but you can picture the scene, can't you? They're all sat around having a smoke and one of them gets a phone call and he starts laughing. He says, boys, put the call in. Look what the police have done for us. They've got rid of the Burger Bar boys in Northampton. We're going to make a fortune. And that's what happens that's what the police do whenever they have what they announce as a successful operation they create an enormous opportunity for a rival or series of rivals to make an enormous amount of opportunity and what that almost always inevitably means is an increase in violence now i you know i i speak to cops as, as part of the law enforcement action partnership i speak to cops literally all over the world and this is noted within police intelligence everywhere, at every level, from street right up to cartel, wherever police have a success, violence goes up. Because if you create a gap in the market, that it, and, and it's so lucrative, that it tends to be fought over. And where it's fought over, violence goes up. So, you know, you, you have to put that into context of what this is doing to our society. When you realise that police are really good at catching drug dealers, really, and, we, and we are really good at it, if you give the police twice the resources, they'll catch twice as many dealers. But that's the problem, because it increases violence. Now, you have to separate this from all other forms of criminality. If a cop arrests a burglar in a town, burglaries will go down because you will reduce crime by doing that, by catching that guy, because there's very relatively few people willing to commit that crime. If you arrest a drug dealer, crime goes up because you never reduce the size of the market. It doesn't matter if, how many dealers you catch. It doesn't matter how many tons you seize. It doesn't matter how many doors you kick in, arrests you make. The market is never reduced in size by police action, but police action does change the shape of the market and that changing shape is only going in one direction were there neil i should ask you i'm just again going on my own experience were there ever dealers that you just left alone because for example they may have just been dealing to their mates 
it was it was it was party drugs. Um, was there any kind of policy? Is what I'm trying to say. Well, in terms, well, it depends on what level of policing. I mean, the kind of stuff I was doing, I would I would never go near anyone just dealing um, cannabis or you know low level uh, pills or something like that because my main my drive was catching uh, heroin dealing gangsters. That was that was my remit, and that was that that was the uh, you know, and for undercover policing, the authority for that undercover policing, according to the Ripper, the Re Re uh, Regulation of Invest Investigatory Powers Act, two thousand and one, states that undercover policing can only be used where conventional policing is not possible or has failed. So it's literally the last, you know, the last option, the nuclear option. Um, so it should only be used for the most serious things, you know, in th theoretically. Although I was roped into to investigating in some nightclubs, but only where the people in control of the supply within that club is using violence or connected to a serious organised crime group. In terms of policing as a whole, well, it depends on what era. You know, in the 1990s, well, after 1997 in particular, the worst mistake of the Blair years well, apart from the Iraq war, but, but you know, push that aside, that the, the worst domestic policy decision of the Blair years was to encourage the use and actually mandate the use of um, measurable targets within public service. So, for example, you know, it took 25 percent of a teacher's time became proving that they were teaching in the police suddenly there were targets and ways of measuring performance. It was all about increasing performance. And, and what that meant is that cannabis arrests would count as an arrest and cops would be measured on these things. So, you know, people that really should be left alone were not. And those targets really did impact on a lot of people, um, particularly, particularly with, with, with um, drugs. And that was a, that was um that was a, a very grim time that people, a lot of people are not aware of, you know, this target driven, driven philosophy is no good at all. And that, that philosophy just doesn't exist the same in policing anymore. It doesn't. Um, and not, not just because of austerity, but because there has been a cultural shift in policing and, um, and moved away from that sort of new labor uh, disaster. So, it, so as I say, it depends on what era. Now, if you look at policing now, there's there's a really interesting cultural shift actually that people a lot of people are not quite aware of. That whereas in in 1999, a, a young PC might have been congratulated for arresting seven cannabis users with a half a half a gram of cannabis in their pockets, nowadays that would not happen with culture within police. So you say you've got a um, a cop in Birmingham and he's part of a busy shift. And they're, they're going to call after call after call, emergency call. And he decides to arrest someone for a gram of cannabis. Culturally, nowadays, that's not going to get any congratulations. In fact, that cop's more likely to be accused of being a lazy so-and-so. Like, what? oh, what you, you know, what you doing taking up half a shift, picking on someone for that? You know, oh, well done you. You know, someone's, someone's likely to be mocked and actually... Uh, criticised by their own shift for doing that because you know because by doing that you're making the rest of your shift work harder on real work rather than the easy pickings and easy work of processing uh, cannabis against some poor person whose life's going to be ruined for that conviction so you know there is a cultural shift in policing which is which is really interesting and encouraging and it's part of the wider tapestry of a sort of police awakening really that this war on drugs is only causing harm to people um and there are better things to be doing with your time yes neil i should ask you um and blex talked a bit about this he he said he got in situations where to maintain his cover he had to take drugs with his you know with his sources or his his contacts how how was that for you was there any kind of policy in place if all this is all so new and was there times I, I just mean I'm talking from again from experience there when you go to a dealer's house you buy something 
and they chop you up a little line and go, there you are, Chris, there's, you know, there's your little well, or, or at the very least they pass you a spliff, right? How was that for you? Yeah, I mean, I actually very rarely had to do any drugs. And in terms of policy, I just took the view that, look, if I ended up having to do something to maintain my own safety, then that's down to my own judgment. And, and, and bosses can either, you know, they can they just have to wear that. And, and I only got encouragement and understanding from the people I worked with. But for the most part, I didn't have to do it. And I did, I've developed some interesting ways of getting around it. I remember once, once, a, once a dealer was extremely suspicious of me in a car and I, it was actually, I, I was driving, this, I had a drive, I was driving a car as part of my cover up with that. Um, a guy who'd introduced me was sat in the passenger seat. The dealer was behind me and they were very suspicious. So I actually cooked up, I cooked up in a syringe, um, you know, practice, I know how to do it. Cooked up a small amount of the bag, you know, drop my filter in the spoon, cook, uh, I cooked it up first, put the filter in the spoon, put it into a syringe, drop my trousers as if I was going to go into my, uh, in, in, into my groin, which is a common place where very problematic uh, users go into because it never properly heals up. So you can go into the same hole over and over and over again. So it's quite common. Drop my trousers as if to go into my groin and inject into the car seat. So that 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 was that was quite useful because you know you can casually have a line of coke or smoke and crack cocaine that wouldn't scare me at all, but you can't be casually doing that with heroin, you know, because because people have a tolerance. But there was one quite scary time when I had I had to uh, have some amphetamine, and that's because I'd made a huge mistake in this operation. I've been going in this pub for weeks. Um, and the place was almost cartoon-like. It was it was ridiculous. It's like in a village in Leicestershire, and gangsters were meeting there from Nottingham, Derby, and Leicester. It was a real weird meeting and trading point. Um, and I the mistake I'd made is that I had made myself out to be a connoisseur of amphetamine, which which I wasn't at all, you know. But I would talk about you know having some really great methamphetamine, some good old fashioned um, 60s style blueies, all, you know, all this kind of stuff. But the trouble is this reputation meant that one day this main gangster came in and said, hey, you, I've got a present for you. And he held up this plastic sealy bag, see-through bag, with this pink toxic looking goo in it. You could almost see it dissolving the plastic in front of your eyes. It smelt like the urine from a glue sniffing cat. Now you've done your amphetamine. You know what I mean by that, don't you? You know, you know that sort of toxic, toxic urine smell. And he says, "Go on then, I'll have some of that. I guarantee you've never had anything like that before." And I'm thinking to myself, "Yeah, you've got no idea, mate." So I stuck my little finger in because I knew I had to. Because the problem I had was he picked up on a momentary reticence on my face, which created a slight element of doubt on his face. I picked up on that slight element of doubt which made me think I've got to throw water on this fire straight away. I've got, I've got to reduce this, this suspicion. So stuck my finger in, put some in my mouth. I could almost feel the mouth also forming instantly. Um, and, then, and then I swallowed it and it's burning in the back of my throat. And he said, you're going to need more than that with your tolerance. So I'm thinking, oh, great. So I stuck my finger in again, shoved a bit more in. Anyway, I didn't have any tolerance because I wasn't this connoisseur that I was making myself out to be. And in no time at all, within 20 minutes, I was uh, I was in problems. I was getting extremely high very quickly. So I made my excuses, declaring my need to go and find a party somewhere. And panicking, got, got to the safe location where uh, I quickly explained that uh, I'm, I might be struggling to write my notes today. Um, so, but I mean, I, I knew enough about it that, you know, you have to have a, a very large amount of amphetamine to overdose. I wasn't worried. I knew I wasn't in any medical danger. Having said that, though, this was an amount which was going to be beyond comfortable. Um, quite quickly, I was not in a good state. This is a very high anxiety, horrible, horrible feeling. Um, most amphetamine at that time was only 5% pure. This, this came back at 40% pure. Um, I, I was a mess. I really was. So I had to get driven home, um, which was quite a journey. 
And I remember thinking, actually, when I'm being driven home, I've got eight cans of Stella in the fridge. That'll take the edge off this. Um, it didn't at all. I didn't even touch the sides. I couldn't even feel the alcohol in the slightest. It just meant that eight hours later, I got a hangover. Um, but I didn't, I didn't sleep for almost three nights. That's how extreme that was. Uh, it was an awful experience. Mind you, my house has never been so tidy, I have to say. Um, <laughs> and you lost, uh, you lost half a stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't eat a lot. It was a, a liquid diet for a, few, for a few hours. But yeah, no, I didn't eat a lot. Yes, my gosh. Um, a couple of things. Do you remember that feeling? I'm, I'm just going on the beginning of your book now. Um, when you're reading the literature from the, 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 I'm going to call it the police college or whatever your your training academy is called. Um, but do you remember the feeling? Because just reading your book evoked feelings in me I hadn't had for for you know, 35 years. And that was the, I'm going to join something and they're going to ask me to do this and I'm going to have to do this training and I'm going to wear this uniform. And it, um, I'm asking you because we get a lot of young people on this channel, Neil, that are, are considering joining up or many of them are joining up and I'm just trying to link in with where, where their minds must be. Yeah, I mean, when I started uh, in the police, it, it, it brought up feelings that I'd got through my childhood. I mean, I, I'm a big reader, and one of my favourite types of fiction when I, when I was a, a teenager was things like um, the Patrick O'Brien um, naval books, C.S. Forrester, Things about sort of duty and you know in this in an historic setting and 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 doing the right thing for for king and country that you know um, being brave against the odds all of those kind of things that sense of duty the sense of, of of doing the right thing for the right reasons you know all of those kind all of those kind of things were evoked you know you know I was flippant going into the place but very quickly I got that sense of duty I also got that sense of belonging and also I did long to become part of a of a team and you know, have that camaraderie um, with with colleagues, and and that is a, that is a great thing to experience. I mean, it took me a while to experience it because, to to a degree, I, I felt I wasn't up to the standard of my colleagues, and a lot of them were suspicious of me. You know, could they trust me? Could they could I back them up? You know, uh, so it was very very difficult for me in the first couple of years because I wasn't good enough. Uh, and and I, and I and I and I did have to grow up very quickly, um, but once I was into that um, that that team environment, and, and certainly once I got into undercover work, and I got that respect of colleagues, you know, it's a great thing to become a to become a part of. It is, it is. The problem is, though, from my perspective, and I suppose with this, I have something in common with some people I know from Veterans for Peace who have found themselves morally damaged by things they've done in the military. I've ended up morally damaged, it's, and it's a, it's a function of my PTSD. It's part of my mental health problems is that I have moral injury. Moral injury was first identified from with vet veterans returning from the Vietnam War, having found themselves doing things which actually breached or were against their, their, their internal sense of ethics. Mm. So, so what I ended up doing actually breached my fund, my core, my core beliefs and my core moral makeup, you know, because that sense of duty and doing the right thing for the right reasons that, that, that became part of me as a, as a teenager writing, right, reading those novels has been breached by the reality of my actions and what I've actually done once I understood the implications of them. So, you know, that there, there is risk in this is what is what I would say. And we need to be aware of what our core values are and whether what we do matches those core values. And in policing, I found myself at the end, once I'd come to the conclusions and I realised that this war on drugs was causing huge harm to individuals and our society, I found myself not being part of an organisation where I felt at one with, as, a, as a team with my colleagues, but 
quite the contrary. I was felt I was in the enemy camp, so to speak, because whereas there were, you know, there's good people I worked with, some good people. There was a lot that, that, that really were not. And you know, there were some colleagues that I, I worked, I did a job in Brighton, my last job of this type. Um, and, and they referred to problematic heroin users as, as smackheads and you know, one of them died one day and they and they literally laughed about it, saying, oh, well, shoplifting will go down today because we know how prolific he was. And that's the way they, they saw it. And it's so, so dehumanizing that it, it made me feel nauseous. And, you know, I felt I was I was so, so much in the wrong place. And that was really hard to find myself in, in that in that situation. I mean, you know, obviously I changed and I had changed. I, I I'd, I'd use my empathy in an aggressive way. I now call it weaponizing empathy. I used it against people to manipulate people. But eventually, you know, I understood. I understood what was going on in the lives of these vulnerable, traumatized people. And so I changed and I realized and the cops, these these unpleasant people around me hadn't realized. But it it, it, it was just to, amongst bullies and vicious people, you know, because they, they they bullied me for my views and my questioning their behavior. You know, they were an unpleasant bunch of people. They were awful. Um, now, I'm not saying all cops are like that. I'm just saying that because of the criminalization of, of drug use, it has led to the point where we do have some elements of our police in, like that. And that was hard to deal with. And it's one of the things that contributed to my mental health crisis, really. In, in in not belonging to this organization that was around me mm. yes mm. It, 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 there's so much we could discuss there neil i mean there's but before we do though before we do i can assume i assume that you can edit this okay so that i can go just visit the toilet for five minutes yeah let me put you on pause and you do that no rush at all Yeah, there's a lot of parallels in what you're saying with with the um, armed forces. Well, the police are an armed force, but you know the the the, the regular military. Um, and I I suppose fundamentally at its root is the fact that these agencies are a part of the state apparatus, aren't they? They they're, they're there to maintain the status quo to a degree they want you know young uneducated naive personnel who are still foolish enough to believe <laughs> you know to believe the bullshit um and and this is this is a this is a big part of it and I, I don't I'm not really going anywhere with this Neil I'm just sort of like trying to speak my mind but it's so hard because you either understand what I'm saying now or you you have no idea what I'm talking about and you probably think like bad guys you know they're the bad guys and 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 I mean it, it, everything is there's just everything is um confused you know we have this this notion that alcohol we oh that's okay whereas as you pointed out and you're a top undercover or you've been a top undercover policeman working in this area and, and now you're a leading proponent proponent for drug reform um i'm someone with 30 years experience in the in the drug world i'm a substance misuse specialist I've been on both sides of the fence, if we want to call it that. And I'm telling anyone listening now, you know, alcohol is is the worst one. And yet I still get people write to me and say, you know, I, I shouldn't even be talking about these subjects. <laughs> it's like, all oh, right, but if I want to talk about getting pissed, that's, that's absolutely fine. E even though my two best friends both drank themselves to death in the last two years right um 
So I kind of get it, Neil. I one of the problems I've had on the podcast is getting some guests to come on if they've had a military or service like background. And I'm just going to say this. It's because they're so indoctrinated into worrying what the group think of them. Um, it has such a powerful effect to indoctrinate young people into, into our forces, what, whichever force that may be. Maybe not perhaps the fire brigade, but I'm guessing it, 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 it will be there to a certain extent. And it, it, the, one of the things I've really worked on in my life and I've done quite well is I've detached myself from my ego because the military and the, gov the, the powers that be in the government, they control your ego when you're young, when you're that person. They control your left brain, as it were. And to move away from that and free yourself as an individual, to become, em to learn empathy, um, to learn what we were really put on this planet for, and it's not this fucking horseshit, right? Getting quite angry now because I'm seeing what they're doing to the children in the schools and it's just so, so wrong. But, but you've got to detach yourself from that and you've got to, to realize that um, you know, the, way, the way these departments operate is they control that ego. And it's, it's a very powerful thing and it, it does affect all of us. As I've got older, I've just had to cut it off, I'm afraid. I'm a free agent. I do what I want, want when I want um, because... I don't hurt, I don't set out to hurt anybody, you know, none of what I talk, no, you know, I give advice, I try to give young people the benefit of my experiences, but it is a sad thing when you see some aging veteran, and they're basically the, still the bully that they were all the time they were in the forces, they still trying to put that service mentality into their, uh, it's not into their life because it's fine if people can live how they want. It's when they want to then put it onto other people. And you're like, dude, you left 20 years ago. Why are you still, you know, living by these rules? And we, we know why, you know, we, we know why they do. It's the power of indoctrination. Um, and yes, Neil, I, I completely understand where you're coming from. It's, it can be an incredibly stressful environment when someone like yourself is clearly a thinker, you're a, you're, you're a thinker, um, you're more in tune with what's really going on, not, with, not what the power, powers that be want to tell you is going on. And I can imagine you got in situations where it felt chalk and cheese with your colleagues and there was quite a lot of bloody chalk, if that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true. I mean, the, the, the most of the, the most extreme example of that is the one that I've, I've just talked about, which is in in Brighton. Because, um, you know, I, I, I've been used to working with professional people, you know, but where the one thing about um, the kind of work that I did is that the, the teams that were put together around me tended to be the people who were who were the most qualified and or who really you know who, who were flyers you know who, who were people who were really good at the job so, so they were almost put into that role as a reward you know to have a, a different to be part of that different operation for a few months but in Brighton it was it was the complete opposite they were an absolute bunch of they were a nightmare they really were the DS running it was just obnoxious you just a briefing he just he just held court and just picked on people and it, it's just a you know wherever you get that kind of bullying canteen culture within a disciplined organization it's it's extremely toxic um but this was doubly toxic because they were dealing with people that they looked down on and to the point that they looked they saw them as inhuman but i mean that i suppose they hadn't had some of the experiences i'd had and i'll give you another example of where you know just to highlight just how unjust it is to see someone as less than human in the, in these circumstances. In, in, in Northampton, I got to know um, 
a young woman who went by the name of Uma. I don't think it was a real name. It was, I think it was a street name. And um, Uma, I got to know, she was a fascinating woman, young woman. And she was a problematic heroin user. And I remember her saying to me one day, well, that, you know, the, the week after she'd be doing a tolerance break. And she said, oh, I can stop the gear. I can stop the gear anytime I want to. Uh, and I do quite often. I'm going to stop next week. I'm going to do a tolerance break. I'm going to stop for two weeks because, you know, it gets cheaper if you have a tolerance break. She says, well, I can't do it for too long, she said. Can't stop for too long because I start to get suicidal again. Because from her perspective, what she was using heroin for was to blot out the memories of her childhood. Because heroin's a great painkiller of the body. It's also a great painkiller of the mind and it blots out memories. Because when she wasn't on heroin, she clearly remembered the feeling of her uncle's fingernails when she was being sexually abused. And that's the trauma she was blotting out. And for her, taking heroin was a very rational decision indeed. Now, most drug use is rational. Professor Carl Hart at Columbia University makes that point very well. Most drug use is rational, and certainly it's rational for her. A very rational decision, because actually, arguably, it was keeping her alive. It was preventing her becoming suicidal, because that's how she was dealing with the trauma of her childhood. And, and that's, how she, that's how she lived. That's how she was keeping herself alive and, and, and functioning. But she was really, she was a beautiful person. One, one day, I thought, it was quite early on, and I realised that people were suspicious of me. You know, who is, who's he? Where's he come from? He's always got the money. What, who is he? So one day I decided to play it rattling, that, you know, I have a day making out myself that I was on my arse, didn't have any money, and really playing rattling. I knew I had to play rattling. And anyway, I saw Uma this, that morning, and she looked at me and said, hey, mate, you hanging out? Are you rattling? Are you struggling a bit? I says, yeah, I haven't even got the energy to graft. You know, I'm struggling. And she reached in her pocket and pulled out a fiver and gave me five quid. And it's quite clearly the only five pound that she had. And I says, yeah, but mate, you're going to need this. What are you giving this to me for? And she said, oh, no, don't worry. I've just had a hit. Um, I, I'll, be, I'll, be next, I'll be fine for the next four or five hours. You need it more than I do. So in the, the simplest and purest generosity you, you, could, you could imagine, from her perspective, at that point in time, her, my need was greater than hers, at least for the next four hours or so. That is the purest generosity. That's two people who see each other, that's someone who is traumatised, who sees someone else who's traumatised, who, without even giving it a second thought, Thought thought about that other person. Thought about thought about me and my my situation, and you know I've not seen generous generosity that pure anywhere, but that's not uncommon amongst problematic heroin and crack cocaine users on the streets. That's not uncommon at all. There is a sense of community and care for each other that people would find astonishing, and it just goes to show that when the human condition is really up against it care for each other really can shine through. And so when you consider just how stigmatized people like Uma are and how they're stepped over when they're on the, on the streets, wrapped up in a sleeping bag and, and begging for money, when they're stepped up or over and looked down upon, people don't understand the situation they're in and just how good some of these people, these people can be um, and how generous. And, you know, I, I just wish people understood that more generally because the dehumanising aspect of, of the way things are as a result of the criminalisation of their behaviour is awful and it, it doesn't seem to be improving. And, and I, I don't know when this goes out to the public, but yesterday uh, was announcement of the uh, another another record increase in drug deaths in Scotland, which now makes Scotland the drug, uh, the, the highest drug deaths in Europe again, but even higher than the USA. And I don't see any change in policy or stigma as a result of those drug deaths. 
You know, imagine if there'd been road deaths suddenly increased by that much. It'd be headline newspapers for, for days. There'd be arguments, arguments between different the, the political parties about how best to deal with it. There'd be criticisms of the sitting government for the lack of, um, for them not predicting that this would happen and not having measures in place to prevent these, this. There would be, there would be pictures of young people who had died as an example of this disaster that's happened by these record increase in road deaths. There would be absolute shock and outrage. Mm. Well, there is way more people die from drug overdoses than die on our roads, significantly more. They're dying in traumatic situations. They're dealing, they're dying in poverty, they're dying on our streets, they're dying uncared for because policy has, has put them in that situation. And we need some outrage, you know? We need some outrage about this uh, because these people are, they're us, they're, our, they're, they're just like us. They're humans who have just not had the same fortune or they've had more trauma than we have and they need care. They don't need to be ignored and stepped over. Yes, very well said, Neil. I was incredibly impressed by, or touched, I should say, by James English, uh, English's Homeless for Christmas documentary. Mm. Um, there were parts in that where you just saw the states that some of these human beings got themselves into just to try to escape pain. That's what it is at the end of the day. Trauma is pain. Mm. Um, there's so much work people like myself could be doing there to enable those that are suffering to see to see a way a way forwards and it's and it's all um you know it's not happening in fact his documentary motivated me so much again i don't know when this when our podcast is going to go out neil but next tuesday i'm doing a stunt called running homeless for christmas and i'm i just got to thank james english for this I, I was so taken with what he did for the homeless population that i'm gonna give up my christmas to run 200 miles around my local running track running is a some silly thing i seem to keep my hand in over the years so it's <laughs> and uh, i didn't want to impinge on james's um uh, documentary prowess and and do the same thing so he went homeless on the streets of Glasgow for Christmas um, and yes it's and I, I guess there's a, a ray of hope at the end of the tunnel or a, a light at the end of the tunnel when you see somebody within a month of being off the street and they've managed to start getting some balance in their life and by balance I don't mean stopping substance misuse because that's not been my, you know, it's not, you know, abstinence is what I'm trying to say is a very misunderstood concept. It's far mm. more important to understand the cycle of change and what is relapse and what is lapse and how does that work to, to educate you and go forward. But, um, when you do see someone that they're starting to get it back together within a month of being off the street, it, you don't recognize this person. Mm. You, know? you don't read that. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that from a judgmental point of view. I'm, I'm saying that I think a lot of these, you know, bully boy policemen that we talked about and people that look down their nose in society at, at, at others. And hopefully that's not, that's a situation that's improving, but I think they'd be surprised if you could see this person a month after they've had some support and they've had some input and they've had some love and empathy and, and, um, and, and some planning done for them and, and, and uh, a bit of housing or whatever it might be. It's like, Oh my God, was that guy, that guy it's yes. Are we ever going to see it? Neil, are we, I know that we have to be um, uh, positive and hopeful, but 
I think this whole the whole war on drugs is again just another tool of the sociopaths that seem to run the whole this whole show and at the minute and I don't want to go talking about the thing because it gets us in trouble with YouTube but they managed to lock the whole world down for the sake of if I understand this right 85 year old people with underlying health issues that might die which is what I thought death is supposed to be right if they're that powerful enough to get to do what they've done what's the way forward with respect to the war on drugs well that's a good comparison I'm not going to comment on the on the virus policy obviously but it's a good comparison to make that you know that there are huge numbers of people dying and there's been no shift in policy to care for them. And that's been an epidemic which has been going on for a long time and been growing. So it is a good parallel to bring, you know. And it, But it needs, to have, it needs to have political motivation. But in order for, for the political motivation to happen, we have to have the social movement grow because politics follows public opinion. It doesn't lead it. And... You know, the need for drug policy reform, it's a social justice issue. And like any other social justice issue, it change comes from social movement rather than political leadership. You know, so homosexual, homosexuality wasn't made legal by political leadership per se. It was about the social movement. Same for the death penalty or whatever the social movement is, whether it's feminism. You know, this is social movement which brings change, not political leadership. So if anyone is listening to this or watching this, and you find yourself agreeing with this or even or, or, or being educated by it. And you think, OK, yeah, we need change. We need this war on drugs to end. We need a different policy. We need regulated drug markets. We need decriminalisation. We need harm reduction. We need to take care for people. Well, if you do believe these things, either whether you believe them before or whether you're convinced now, then you are part of this social movement. And I'm looking at you. You're part of the social movement. And it's important that you take the responsibility to continue to make the social movement grow, which means you have to talk about other people with other people about this, direct other people to listen to this podcast or, or other things, or listen to or, or direct them to the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, uh, Leap UK, Leap Europe, wherever we are. Listen to us and write to your MP, engage in the political process. You can change this. If you're a Labour supporter, get involved with the Labour Drug Policy Reform Group. If you're a Conservative supporter, support and get in touch with the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group. All people that we work with at LEAP, the Green Party, they have the best, I would say, uh, drug manifesto. The Liberals have some good policies as well. The SNP have some brilliant outspoken uh, uh, members, particularly Ronnie Cowan is a favourite of mine. Plaid Cymru, they have some fantastic people who advocate drug policy reform. Arvon Jones is a Leap UK member, uh, PCC for North Wales. Leanne Wood, um, leader of, of, of Plaid Cymru, she, she's brilliant on drug for, law reform, former uh, probation officer herself. You know, there are politicians who you can engage with and encourage, but politicians follow, follow public opinion. They, they, that, that's the way that democracy works. I'm not going to criticise a politician for going where the votes are or where they perceive their constituency votes are because a politician has a view outside drug policy reform they, they want to stay in power in order to put forward other policies and they can't stay in power unless they follow the views of their electorate so we have to make them realize that this social movement is growing and has grown enough that it's in their political interests to advocate changes in policy, to save lives, and make our society safer. Um, that's up to you. It's up to all of us to make this social movement grow. That's, this is how we change things. Do we need to put a focus, Neil? Um, by this, I mean, there, as you said, the, the biggest expenditure in our police force goes into the war on drugs, okay? We should also not forget the massive cost of keeping somebody in prison. And I'm not talking about the cost of the taxpayer. I'm talking about where that money goes. 
which is more and more we're moving into a theater where this money goes to private individuals, private companies. Clearly, these individuals, the ones that are selling the police equipment, the ones that are running the prisons, um, the ones possibly that also are controlling the drugs that come into the country. Do we need to put a focus on on them? Because they're, these are very powerful players. They're, they're either high, very high up in the corporate world. They have a lot of swing on our politicians. They probably have most of the politicians in their pocket. Um, and like I say, these guys are just corporate criminals on a huge scale, which is why they probably play the drug game as well, right? You know, it's the left hand and the right hand sort of sort of scenario. Um, do we need an audit, Neil, of where this money is going, who it's going to, what 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 their conflicts of interest are? Yeah, I mean, you, you make an interesting point there. Um, and in terms of the corporate interest in the UK, that 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 can be easily overstated. But let's just I'll cover that with America for the, for the moment, because American prisons are private. Um, one of the most powerful lobbying groups in relation to drug policy in the United States is actually the, the prison officers unions and the police unions and the prison officers that uh, unions that, you know, they belong to private industry. And, you know, different states have actually contracts with private prisons to provide those private prisons with the minimum number of people as inmates, which is really twisted. And so, yeah, absolutely. In those terms, an audit would make it quite clear that there's a huge corporate financial interest in maintaining the war on drugs, criminalizing people and locking them up. You know, the America is, a, is in a mess as a result of the war on drugs. They now have 25% of the world's prison population. And the, 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 and the population of America is only 5% of the world actual population. So that's an extraordinary incarceration rate, which is a social disaster for every community across the United States. That's not the same in, in the UK. You mentioned private prisons. Actually, believe it or not, the number of private prisons has actually gone down in the UK over the last decade. I think we're at 11 at the moment. And, you know, they, a couple have been re taken back into state control. There isn't a great push for private prisons in the UK, and it's a very minor issue. So the private industry thing isn't necessarily the same in, in the UK, but mm. I wouldn't want to emphasise that as a driving force anyway, to be honest, because you can put it in much simpler terms that you made the very valid point that it's expensive to put, keep someone in prison. Well, keep someone in prison for a, a, a year is £45,000. That's an enormous amount of money. Quite often people get sent to prison because of problematic uh, substance use. Now, if you consider the most regularly problematic drug is heroin, if you consider that if you supply somebody with heroin as part of a heroin assisted treatment clinical setting, so, so government providing clean heroin rather than that person buying it from organised crime, that costs £12,000 a year. Now, heroin assisted treatment is the most successful treatment for problematic heroin use in the world. We have the evidence of this from Switzerland that it works better than any other kind of therapy. It works better than um, most drug treatment systems, including opioid substitution therapy, where people are given methadone or subutex instead of heroin. So actually providing clean heroin is the most effective way to get people through treatment and actually into some kind of recovery. But even for those people who do not end up coming off heroin, it's still better for them to be given clean, pure heroin from the government rather than going into organised crime. And if that person is alive and safe, who cares if they're on heroin? I don't care. If that's what they need, if that's what, they, if that's what their situation dictates, as long as they're not having to deal with gangsters and being sexually exploited for it, fine. It's better for them, it's better for us, it's better for everyone. It's also significantly cheaper, significantly cheaper. It, it, the, the cost of treatment people, even the most expensive forms of any treatment, is still way, way cheaper than policing the whole criminal justice system, cost of court systems, the cost of prisons. You know, the, the, the financial difference is absolutely enormous. And 
in terms of an evaluation which you alluded to well there's never been an evaluation about the the efficacy of prohibition drug policy there never if you were to really break it down and 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 look at the benef cost, benefits versus the cost we, we, the, the policy would be gone completely completely gone i mean just policing policing alone it doesn't reduce crime Poli drugs policing increases crime so it can't be there can't be any cost benefit there it, it makes policing harder you know it, it makes our society more violent over time we end up having more violent murders to investigate we have a, a knife crime epidemic where teenagers are stabbing each other you know that's not come out of nowhere that's come out of decades of drug policy you know i mentioned earlier that the county lines this phenomenon of, of children being exploited to, to sell drugs it's not just county lines they're being exploited to sell drugs in the city centers as well that's not come from nowhere Can you explain neil for our friends at home what county lines is for those that don't know yeah okay so county lines is the phenomenon where um children are being used from the the, the big city hubs to transport and sell drugs in smaller drug markets and the the, the three predominant um, cities which which do this is London, Birmingham and Liverpool. And so gangs from those cities exploit children to transport the drugs quite often uh, rectally to get them to sh shove them inside themselves, transport them on trains or drive them to places. And then those children are put in position for a couple of weeks at a time. They're given the phone number, which is the line, the phone line, and they are directed to deal people, customers, and deliver so they're, they're the foot soldiers in the in the trade but quite often it's an adult sat comfortably in liverpool who's taking the call and directing the child to to deliver the drugs or meet the person to sell them and and but it's not just county lines where they're traveling outside the city children are also exploited within the city centers as well to deal all sorts of of drugs but this has not just happened because someone thought it was a good idea it's not just suddenly appeared you know, and this is a, a recent phenomenon that children are being used in such a widespread way in the last over the last six years. It hasn't come from nowhere. You know, if, you, if you'd said to a heroin dealer in 1974 who couldn't believe his luck that, that the, the British government had stopped prescribing heroin to people and he now had this wonderful customer base that he could he'd exploit and make all this money. If you travel back in time and said to that 1974 heroin dealer, dealers like you. In in the in 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 a forty five years, are going to be exploiting children to deal your co commodity. He'd probably be quite offended. He says, "No, no one would ever do that. Who would do that? Who would who would exploit children and put them at risk in this trade?" He'd, he'd probably be offended that that you can think he would ever do that. But yet this has happened. So why has this happened? Well, I told you about my operation with the Burger Bar Boys in Northampton, didn't I? Where they'd taken over the control of Northampton from Birmingham and and they were making the money from doing that but they were all adults they were all hands on it was all adults do, doing the transporting of the drugs and the selling of the drugs the deliveries and holding the cash and all that kind of thing and all of those adults got caught and they got adult prison sentences because they were caught so organized crime always adapts to police activity always so it's the logical strategic decision to employ children to carry out those tasks, to do the deliveries, to do the stashing, to do the transportation, because children are the perfect strategic buffer zone between investigating police and dealers. By using children, they cocoon themselves, they create this buffer zone and protect themselves. It means they're much less likely to get caught. The children can get caught, but to the gangsters, the children are disposable, they're cheaper labour, they're easier to manipulate, they're easier to scare into not telling the police what, what's going on. And there's an endless supply of them. So, you know, when you see in the newspapers, as I'm sure in a few weeks time, there will be a press release from police saying we've rescued 80 children, we've caught 20 adults. Well, the elephant in the room when you read that newspaper about 80 children being rescued is that rescue those children that means another 80 children are going to get corrupted into the into the um into the trade 
that that's the reality of it that no one's admitting to no one's facing up to because over the last six years year on year more children have, have been dragged into the trade and exploited for it and not a single police action has re reduced the number of children involved because police never reduce the size of the market and this is going to get worse you know but how how bad does it have to be you know how many kids have to get murdered how many children have to be exploited in this trade and sexually abused and blackmailed before we actually realize this policy is an utter disaster and change direction yes it, i'm not even going to pretend i know the answer to that neil it, it it's it, it it's a very sad fact of life it's something that adds pain to my life or it attempts to add pain to my life every day because I'm I've obviously involved in this this area um, I want the best for all people that's just you know that's just how I am and and when you've been socially excluded it's a very it's not a very nice place. It's also incredibly damaging on your psyche. And, and, and um, in fact, I just tell you an interesting thing that really ties into what you're saying, Neil, is I was never damaged by um, the actual like physical effects of, of, of chronic drug use even though I lost my completely lost my hen, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even though I, like I said, I ended up with one pound 87 to do my, my fortnightly shop and, 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 and ended up in utter squalor. Like no, none of that is what scarred me. What, what was the harsh thing is the social exclusion, you know, all I was was a very damaged young man trying to make sense of this, of myself and this life. And I did it this way, you know, and that's, if people want to judge that, that's, that's nothing to do with me. But what, what was the, the, the thing mentally that makes it so hard is society's reaction to you you know society's reaction everyone oh fucking get off that shit yeah you know oh have you seen what he's at? and and it and it ah it's you know you live you live in a very solitary existence you're doing something, you don't know why you're doing it. You don't know why it's spiraled into what it has. You don't understand childhood trauma that actually you've been, you know, you're not, you're not a happy cookie, right? And this is a coping mechanism, but, you know? And, and it's, you know, Neil, I'd go out my front door I hold my head up as high as I could because I was, I had that much respect for myself, even when I'd lost maybe self-confidence, self, self, this, self, that I still held my head up because if I was going to get through this thing, there was nobody walking this planet that was a better person than I was or, or a worse. We were all equal. And I was just going through an education phase in my life. Um, and if people didn't like it, that wasn't my fault, right? But I'm sorry I'm going around the houses a bit. It's just such a hard thing trying to explain when, when in our society, because there's no education about mental health, right? And, and substance use and, and the real things that are important that affect all of us that is always hard trying to say stuff in sound bites that every single person will understand or without upsetting this group because they think you're trying to say this when in actual fact, no, you're just trying to like, smooth the way for all of us. But that damage, that psychological damage, it was nothing to do with the substance or the substance use is to do with society's treatment of me 
when I was going through a mental health condition, um, you know, uh, so, <laughs> sorry, I don't know if, I don't know if that helps anybody listening or if that makes sense, Neil, but um, yes, it was a harsh, that was the hardest thing. It was, it was, I used to just say to people, leave me alone. Just, just let me be, let stop getting on at me to change to be like you are just let me be i'm not hurting anyone you know okay i used to shoplift bovril <laughs> i'm i'm the bovril bandit <laughs> but that was the hardest thing everyone wanted to change me and i ir irregardless of what you think about substance use i was on an educational process that ultimately gave me my dream life I'm not suggesting everybody does what I did. I say, I always say, you live your life. You just let me live mine. Thank you. Then, then we're all good. Um, Neil, can we finish? Uh, we'll finish up talking about books because you're a, an author at least twice over now, is it? Yeah, two books. Yes, ma massive congratulations. Um, and I read some of your book earlier. It's very, very well written. Is that something that came naturally to you? Or? Oh, no, no. I, ha I have to put a shout out <clears throat> to my to my co-writer, uh, J.S. Raffaele. Um, <clears throat> so for Good Cop, Bad War, which is which is my memoir, um, a, a lot of the stories of from my undercore work is, is in there. Um, I, I was paired up with J.S. because, you know, I, I mean, I can write blogs and I can write some things and I'm and I'm not bad but you know it takes a really skilled genuinely skilled wordsmith to make a readable book I think and so that's so I told my story to JS and 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 he wrote it down and I think one of the most one of the best decisions that a writer can make that us mortals mere mortals that can't make is what bits to leave out you know and how to make it concise and and and, and cut through to something so he would he would I would tell him all this stuff and there's so much just ended up not in the book. So, so JS is the skill behind making it readable. And then for the second book, Drug Wars, um, Drug Wars was important for me to get out there because it, I mean, it's essentially a history book, but it, but it, but it is through lots of personal narratives, different people's personal narratives. And Drug Wars was important to me because, you know, when you talk to people about drug policy, that they don't, they don't have a sense of change over time that it's not always been this way and that things are getting worse. And it's only if people realize that change, that, that, that change has been caused by policy over time that they can think, oh, well, in that case, we should stop and, and go back to how things were or we, can, we should find a different path. So drug wars, it's a bit, it, there are some scary bits, but because of the truth of the corruption involved in it, um, you know, but I make no apologies for that. Um, it is the truth, and um, it's a it's a history, particularly of UK drug policy. But but I loved the couple of years that that JS and I spent researching that because we we put a lot of work into the research and then and then the writing. But but the writing talent is all JS's. Oh, well, it's it's very um, honourable that you 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 give him credit. I I, I think it, I certainly know of authors that don't. Um, but. Was it, um, what can we say? W was it an educational experience work working with a co-writer then did, and, and the writing process? Oh, oh God, yeah, ab absolutely it was. Because, um, you know, he, he is he is a real talent. But the, but I loved, I mean, the thing is, I, I'm, I'm really good friends with JS now and it was really good to get to know him and I learned a lot from him. And, and in terms of the research that we did together for Drug Wars, you know, we learned we learned together for that. Um, yeah, it was it was a fantastic experience. He's a he's a guy with a brain the size of a planet. So you know, quite often I do these podcasts, and people will then follow me on Twitter afterwards. But follow follow JS as well because uh, he's one of the great brains in British drug policy now. Mm. Was it um, easy for you to get a publishing deal? Yeah, they found me. Uh, really, I mean, and the the agent found me. Um, after I did a, an interview um, for, for Vice, and he proposed that I that I do a book, 
you know, and I, I, I hadn't really thought about doing a, a, a book. I know I had to do something to try and convince people, but obviously a book was a, the best idea. But I found, I found it a difficult decision to make because I'm an introvert. I don't like too much communication with people. I don't mind isolation so much. And I don't like the attention at all. I, I genuinely don't. Um, I find it difficult. So it was a real decision for me to do this. And it's been, um, and it's something I just have to continually I have to keep getting used to, you know. If you'd said to me, like back in 2014, if someone had said, you're going to do it, you're going to write a book, you're going to end up speaking to audiences. And some, you know, I've, I spoke to one audience in Newcastle, it was over 2,000 people. And and I'd have just laughed at you, like, why, why would I do that, you know? But, but this is the space I found myself in that, I have the knowledge and the experience that needs to be shared and explained to people. And that means I have to be in the public eye to do it. So uh, it's back to be, it's back to a sense of duty. <laughs> You're a warrior, mate, in the traditional sense of warrior. And warrior doesn't mean about beating people up or waving a sword. It's, it's a uh, warrior is all about following the moral compass, Neil, isn't it? And doing what is right. Mm. And, and not being intimidated or frightened into going with going with the crowd and all that's going to do if you if you're that kind of person is you're making it harder for the next generation and you're stealing their freedom and 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 their right to life um so i commend you i commend you neil very very much and on that note um I want to thank you. Thank you for your fascinating story. Is there anything you'd like to add, Neil? Or what? What? What's? What does the future hold? Hold for you now? What do you do alongside your your public speaking and and working on the books and the po podcast? Because you've been on many now. Yeah, I mean, well, I just any any opportunity I have, any platform I have to try and reach new audiences to 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 explain these things because. You know, I do find, uh, like all of my colleagues at Leap, we find that this isn't actually so complicated for people. It just it just takes the platform to be able to reach people and explain it to them. You know, very few people will listen and think, oh, no, that's completely wrong. That doesn't make sense because it's not these, these concepts, these things I'm explaining are not that difficult, really. Mm -hmm. it, it makes sense once it's explained that we are, we are all being conned to believe that our current drug policy is a success because it, it's not at all. It's, it's a disaster. And I know I've said this earlier, but please just emphasize the fact that if you do, if, if you have been convinced or are you or, or inspired to do something more about it, you are that social movement. We, we, we all have a part to play. And even if that is only following certain organizations on social media and always sharing what they put out, because that does make a difference. It increases our audience. So please do follow the Law Enforcement Action Partnership on all social media channels. That's not just Leap UK, also Leap in the USA. If you're if, if if you're anywhere around Europe, you know, we have we have Leap France, Leap Germany, Leap Scandinavia, Leap Australia. Um, follow the police movement for reform. But also, it's not just us cops and uh, other law enforcement figures. There are also other wonderful organizations out there that you can support. A particular and very important one is an organization called Transform Drug Policy Foundation. They're important because they're the clever people who have all the answers to the questions. Because if you say, okay, it's all very well saying we need to do something about this, how do we go about doing it with policy? They know exactly, they know how to regulate each individual uh, drug market. They have the answers to those questions. They have a campaigning arm called Anyone's Child, and anyone's child is made up of traumatized families. They are traumatized families who know that their fam that they wouldn't be traumatized if drug policy was different. So you've got they've got brilliant speakers like Anne Marie Coburn, who lost her 15 year old daughter to an accidental MDMA overdose. Um, Ray Lakeman from the Isle of Man, who lost his two sons on the same night to MDMA. Lots of people who lost their children to heroin that they didn't need to have lost them. It's our policy that's killed these children, or it's parents who have their, who've had their children traumatized by them being sent to jail for, for for a for a drug offence. Or, you know, these are families who we need to listen to. So, 
That's another organisation I would recommend people Neil, listen. Could you say the name again, just so I can write it down? Yeah, the organised the campaigning arm of Transform is Anyone's Child. So on chit on Twitter, it's at Anyone's Child, um, and at Leap UK, uh, one of the most important things that we do uh, is the events that we do when we pair up with Anyone's Child. So so what we normally do, we get hosted by a member of Parliament or a councillor or university or someone and we invite all the prominent local politicians we, we invite all the local press we invite lots of community figures and you know a, a, a cop like me or former cop like me stood next to a parent who's lost a child explaining to that community that's very powerful and so if anyone out there is wondering well, what can i do well if you have access to you know if you're connected to a local community if you have a village hall or you know the local mayor, or you know a councillor who might host this. Get in touch with us. You know, we we will come and do an event for you. We we, we do this all over the country, and we have huge, huge success in this. You know, we've had, we've brought MPs onto our, in, into the fold, into the reform family as a result of these events. These events are very powerful. So if you can help organise one of these, please please do. It, it will make a difference, I promise you that. Um, but also, you know, if you just if your involvement is just going to be limited to social media, that's fine. You can do a lot on social media. Um, within a week or so, there will be a new uh, social media short coming out, uh, which we did with Anyone's Child and Transform. Um, and it is designed to respond to police social media posts where the police claim that their activity is a success. And so it's, it's a video that's designed to be posted in the comments in response on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, wherever it is, to unpick that a little bit and to say, hang on a minute, no, you're not reducing crime here. So please look out for that video, it'll be featured prominently on the Anyone's Child and Transform website, and it'll, it'll be on our website eventually What's as well. What's the title of it, Neil? I'm actually not sure what the title is yet. It's probably not been decided, but it'll be obvious what it is, because it features me talking to a camera and mocking um, the police photo op policing. It'll probably be some title, be something around photo op policing, because that's what it seeks to mock and unpick a little bit um so yeah there's, there's, there's always social media things you can do but please follow engage on social media but if the only thing you can do is persuade one person whether it's your mother your father your sister your friend then take the time and persuade those people direct them to this podcast direct them to my tedx video and the you know the, the other the other things the other resources that we have so Thanks for letting me rant about that, but it's important people feel that they can, they can do something because they can. Not a rant at all, mate. Not a rant at all. It's what wouldn't it be great if we were talking all this good, positive stuff in our in our lives all the time and um, giving giving voices to people like you, Neil. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. To Thanks a lot, Chris. Ah, no, and let's chat again, you know, maybe um, you come on my live show and we'll take some questions from the from from all our friends out there and, and maybe clear up a few misconceptions for the, the younger people that have been subjected to this. Let's just call it a brainwashing illicit agenda that's been forced on all of us, um, where the first uh, uh, the first victim of it all is obviously truth. So yes, yeah, so everybody at home, much love to you all. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. Massive thank you again to, to our guest, Neil Woods. Um, buy Neil's book. I'll put a link to it below the podcast. Get involved um, in the projects that we've discussed. I'll put links to them again underneath the podcast. Like and subscribe if, if I'm not asking too much and see you all soon.